Okay, hello everyone. The time has come to introduce our next talk. Uh, let me welcome here Jiri Konečný, who will be our speaker. If you have any questions for Jiri, please use the Q&A section here in Hopin. We'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome on my talk uh, about the GitHub Actions and the question if they are safe to be used. And uh, I want to point out why I even uh, created the presentation and started to think about it. It's basically that I found the blog post about how to make the Fedora Core OS server uh, used as a uh, GitHub uh, runner, self-hosted runner, without any info about the problems that could be raised by that with the issues and the security problems, basically. So I uh, told myself that I have to somehow uh, try to enlighten people to avoid doing mistakes we already did, and we try to avoid. So to help you with that. So a little bit about me. I'm the uh, Anaconda team lead. Uh, Anaconda OS installer from the Fedora, just, as you, just in case you don't know the name. And uh, we uh, moved to GitHub Actions uh more than a year back i'm not sure if it's two years even uh with a great help with uh, from martin Pitta. uh thanks a lot for that and uh after from that time we are basically using mainly mainly uh, github actions for all the automation we are also using packet and similar stuff but it's more like site projects for us and we are heavily using github actions also, uh, please bear with me. I'm a bit ill, and one of the benefits of the virtual conference is that I won't spread it to you. So I am using that as a benefit right now. <laughs> OK. So yes. So uh, a bit about what we will talk here about, uh, I'll talk here. So first, I will get you familiar with the GitHub Actions. Just a slight fast look on that because it uh, could be quite complicated, but from the base usage, it's it's pretty, pretty easy to use. And if you are not familiar, it will be hard for you to catch up. So uh, that's the first pass. But then, then we will talk about the potential dangers uh, which could be there. And then we will, the second part, or the last part of the presentation will be will be focused on the uh, self-hosted runners because they are a special category about that. So, uh, what is the GitHub Actions? Yeah, basically it's automation of anything you want to automate. There are definitely restrictions, but most of them could be somehow. Uh, avoid it or mm, if you are smart enough you can do uh interesting things uh however definitely you should not uh, do something like uh mining crypto uh, cryptocurrency or anything like that uh, github won't be uh, happy about that and probably blocked your account so uh please don't do uh similar stuff but other than that you are uh you are able to do basically everything anything you would like to do with it. And I can recommend it because it's really a great way to uh, do a simple automation with, uh, which is pretty transparent, I would say. And uh, so uh, this is our action stuff uh, in the in the Anaconda. And it show, shows you the automation we have there uh, for basically everything. Some of these are not really used now, but it's still there because it was used in the past and it's still active it's still enabled and when you see that you can uh when you when you click on that uh that's the basically automation of anything it could be i, I will i will talk about it later and then you can see that there are uh they are basically releases so this this one is pretty new and it's basically release automation release from the from the tag we will create a tag in the container in the repository and it will automatically create a release and then it will be automatically uh consumed by a packet uh to make the downstream release for fedora and similar stuff you can do really a lot of that yeah so 
And if you're using the automation uh, there to uh, run the tests on the pull request, uh, when there is a contribution to your code, then you will get on the bottom of the page something like this. And it will it will basically show you uh, what is what failed with the tick here, uh, what was skipped. These are tests which are not really usable on this uh, on this project on this pull request. In this case, it was because uh, the label it was not set because it's not related. Or there could be uh, success or expected, which means that this is required to be run. However, it wasn't right run yet for some reason. And you can block merging before uh, the above are uh, successful, but specifically the required ones. The other, if you have something which is not required, it won't be there until it's started. And then it could be like skipped, like in this, uh, in this case. It started, find out that it's not really meaningful for this, uh, for this run, and then it's skipped. So it doesn't matter the result. Yeah, so um, most important part of the of the GitHub uh, actions are workflow files. And the workflow files is basically, uh, they, they are publicly accessible on the repository. There's a .github uh, directory uh, with the workflow files in it. And uh, it, they, they contain, it's a YAML code, and they contain all the uh, complete description of the, of the automation of the process you want to automate. And as I said, it's a directory. And also, I would want to, it's, it's like a bit ahead, but I want to mention that one of the most important one is the GitHub token. And uh, basically, you can uh, specify that in the, in the uh, you can call them from the, from the automation in a few ways from the, from the bash or from the, from the uh, directly in the YAML this way. You can find everything like that from the from the documentation. Here's a just quick look. It's a bit complicated, uh, a bit complicated workflow, but just don't care about that. There's a name. Here are tri triggers, which uh, tells you when it should be started. Uh, the the automation, the the workflow file basically, and then there are jobs, which describes what you should do. Uh, what 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 it will it will do. Sorry, what it will do. So basically, in this case, there's a contain refresh containers, which will basically uh, build our containers uh, we have for testing uh, in some parallel exec execution, like here, and uh, with, with the configuration here. And then there are steps, which are uh, one, one by one uh, information. Yeah, I could, I should probably make it bigger for you to read. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so basically there are there are steps and the steps describes the uh, steps you the, the job will be do, uh, doing. And that's it, this will, this will do the checkout of the repository uh, and uh, this will run the bash script, basically the run part will run some bash code here etc 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 it's not that important really uh, like going into details you will find everything in the documentation I will just want to show you what's the part of it so and uh, after this quick look hopefully it will it was a bit understandable uh, we can look on the interesting part of the presentation and that is potential dangers so first thing I would I would like to show you here is basically there are as I saw, show you before uh, there are triggers there could be scheduled trigger which is run on some cron job but it's basically cron job you will specify when it will be run and it will be run periodically based on the on the cell settings on the configuration uh, then you have workflow dispatch which is manual you have to you could uh, then just press the button in the action step and it will run. But the most important one, if you have a project and you want to test the code of the project uh, on, on the contributions is the, are, are the pull request and pull request target. These two triggers uh, will do exactly that. They will basically uh, start when there is a change on the pull request or if the new pull request is created. 
But the point is, what's the difference? Because when you read the documentation, it's described there, but it's kind of complicated. I wasn't really, really that, uh, uh, like, under. I wasn't able to understand it from the first uh, reading through the documentation. Uh, so basically, uh, if I, my, if I want to explain it in a simple way, it's where you will, where, where the where the uh, code, where the where the job will be started. If it's on the uh, contributor side or, or basically in the target side, and if it's run in the target side, then the contributor couldn't change the content of the workflow. Basically, if the contributor will change the workflow file during the pull request, the pull request target, in case of pull request target trigger, it will uh, use the workflow from the from the target branch, not from the from the changed one. That's the main difference, I would say. That when you create a pull request and you have pull request target, a uh, pull request trigger, it will be used. The the, the code, the, the execution will be on the changed uh, stuff from the from the contributor, uh, and if you have pull request target, it will be on opposite from the from the target branch. So, and I will have like some uh, sentences, I will say, uh, sentences before that or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and so, okay. In that case. If I if it's that way, I will use the pull request target everywhere because I want to have it safer. And in this case, the contributor couldn't like change the workflow file and do the changes based on like I want to I don't know use uh, like commit my parts to the rep uh, repository, so I will change the workflow file and it will work. Yeah. Um, uh, wrong. Nope. It doesn't work really like that. Um, or it it does, but um, okay. The main difference between these two is that uh, the pull request also taking the token, the GitHub token. And the GitHub token is one thing which is then generated always for each execution of the workflow. That has to be the token. And the token is generated in the case of pull request target. The pull request target is generated from the target branch, which means from the target repository, which means with the privilege of the repository owner, basically of the repository. And in case of pull request, it's generated uh, from the uh, from the contributor side. So it means that if you have a pull request target and you have, for example, some script or something like that, then I can easily use the token, which is accessible there in the script and recommend your stuff, change the history, anything. So please be aware of the pull request target uh, trigger. It could be problematic. Also, it has access to your secrets. So anyone could read the secrets or upload them to the code by doing the changes in the workflow. Because basically, when you have the pull request target, it will, by default, check out the target branch. But in general, you don't want to do that because you have to talk, you want to test the code uh, on the on the on in the pull request. So you will probably check out the pull request instead of that, the pull request code. And then you are getting to this situation. So anyone doing any change there could do anything, basically, with your repository, almost anything. So basically, pull request, even if it's run like anyone could change the workflow file, uh, is still safer because uh, there's no privilege to change the, uh, the repository. And it's also even much easier to develop. I definitely uh, recommend you to use the pull request. It's the recommended one even from, the, from the GitHub. And it's uh, it allows you to uh, make, it sim make, make your life simpler and safer. However, it's also not that simple, definitely. So, OK, I will I will talk about the however a bit later. But uh, let's talk about something a bit, something a bit different now. So a user needs to be able to execute a custom settings for the script. And basically, you have to allow it. So, okay, 
what about using pull request uh, trigger, pull request comments, and basically uh, run the, not sorry, pull request, not pull request trigger, pull request comment and pass the comment content to the uh, to the uh, to the application you uh, you want. That's definitely doable. You can do you can use uh, the trigger, which will uh, be executed on on command on a pull request, and then take the comment content and use it for something. And there could be situation you want to do uh, when you want to do that. In our case, we needed we. Uh, have to have this because we uh, wanted to be able to run the Kickstarters, which is the CI, basically our CI, pretty complicated one, hard to test locally, hard to run locally. It's it's not that hard to run locally, but it will consume a lot of time so uh, to run and a lot of resources. But basically, we wanted to make it a more more configurable, so we uh, use this solution because there could be a like, specification I want to just this test or like uh, the uh, test type, all the tests from the test type, from the group of tests, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to have this one. So basically it works and we are using it. However, uh, could be could be also a bit complicated. So, uh, yeah. What I want to show you here is something we had wrong in our, in our first solution. However, I must say that uh, GitHub is uh, great uh, to, like, to, to try to help uh, you with, with your workflows. And they contacted us that we have a possible shell injection there. What we did before was that we were just like using this the variable which is the information about what was part of the command directly uh, in here. And it sounds fine, but anyone who worked with the bash and has experience with the bash knows that you can pass basically anything here. Like for example, uh, the uh, quotes, quote mark, and uh, then you can put your code with anything you want. So yeah, it's not it's not great. We missed that first, but we uh, got an info, uh, basically mail from the from the uh, GitHub uh, security team, and they uh, informed us that we have vulnerability in our code, and told us to create an environment variable and put it there. And I tested it; it works. I'm not sure pretty uh, pretty much how really. I guess there's some escaping in 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 way or something like that. I'm not sure, but you are not able if you if you put it to the environment variable first, you are not able to like uh, do the shell injection. So if you not to, no, want to know more, I would be interested if you find out. <laughs> I was trying to look on the documentation, etc. So unfortunately, I wasn't successful. <laughs> I'm not sure what's happening there, but they recommended us the solution. I tried it, and uh, yep, and it works. So just in case you want to do it, this is the way, and it's working pretty nicely. Also, I want to just point out that uh, if you want to trigger a uh, trigger workflow on when this, there's a command, yeah, this is the way exactly. Uh, when you want uh, to uh, comment, like start the job based on command, you will do it this. The command, issue command types created, that's all. You can also that give there like times modified, et cetera, but I don't want to have that really. So, next interesting part, self-hosted runners. Self-hosted runners, uh, they are great, really. Uh, however, <laughs> so reasons why you want to have the self-hosted runners. There are a few. Uh, one of that is, for example, that you don't, like, uh, you don't have uh, resources uh, accessible. 
So this allows the network would be in on your internal network uh, and just connect to the connect to the uh, GitHub actions and use the internal stuff by that. Uh, but one of the benefits for GitHub Actions, you don't have to have public IP. I want to mention that because that's great. You don't have to have accessible hosts from the like servers that runners from the outside world. You're just connecting to the uh, to the to the GitHub Actions and registering your host there. So it's from this point of view, it's better safer, but it has another drawbacks. And our main do, uh, reason to have it is uh, that we had to have access to def kvm socket and unfortunately github runners don't have that and in most situations you won't be able to allow to find that uh, anywhere else it's really rare uh, to find a place where uh, where it's like especially if it's free uh, and i have access to def kvm please tell me it would be great to uh, use machines like that or have access to machines like that. Because basically, I asked a few people why it's such a problem to have access to DevKVM. And the response was that uh, it's potentially dangerous because the DevKVM is uh, not really uh, user space. I hope I'm not saying it wrong. And you are able to get uh, to basically control or there's some possibility that you will be able to like access the other VMs on the machine. And in case uh, when you have uh, VMs as uh, probably GitHub has, then it will be like uh, attacking from from project to another one by this. So yeah, mm, I don't know. And the drawbacks, definitely. You have to take care of your machines. And they should be up to date because you don't want to have security issues there. Even though it's not accessible from the internet, it's still you know, like contributors are running the code there. So they could somehow use the tools there to do mess on your system. Uh, it's much, much easier. Next thing is much, it's much, much easier to shoot yourself into the feed uh, when you are using the self-hosted runners uh, than if you are not using them and using the GitHub. And the simple, simple thing about this, basically, uh, you have more, uh, much bigger, uh, much bigger surface attack surface by by using by by having having self-hosted runner because it's your runner, your responsibility. If it's GitHub, it's their responsibility, I would say. And uh, if you have it on internal network, then uh, yeah, it could be. Like, you should you should be you should have really uh, keep an eye open to uh, any potential vulnerability or anything. Yes, exactly. Your responsibility versus GitHub Microsoft responsibility. Yeah, you can point the finger. Um, so, and uh, of course, biggest concern here is the security. If you if you are on the on the network of the internal network or anything like that, as I said before. And I want to mention by uh, bold letters that GitHub recommends to avoid using self-hosted runners on public repositories. We are doing exactly that because we are basically forced to because of the FKVM if we want to have the GitHub actions. But yeah, they don't recommend it. And yes, recommends. It doesn't mean that they will like uh, disable your self-hosted runners or they will start to like uh, uh, telling you that, uh, I don't know, uh, you break it yourself or something like that. They are trying. They are trying to really improve the situation about this. But still, it's, yeah, it could be a problem. There's a link for the, docu the, the documentation in the slides if you are interested uh, about the recommendation. So, potential danger. Uh, I don't have a problem with a self-hosted runner for when I'm running it just for one specific workflow, which is not triggered even by the pull request. What could be wrong? Because yeah, I have I have something like a, I I would say schedule task, uh, schedule trigger. Workflow with the schedule trigger, and the trigger will once a day uh, do a build of my project in the internal network, for example. So what could we give wrong? It's separate the task. It's not really 
like accessible from outside or, or, or executable from the outside. So that's fine. Whatever. Uh, nope. Yeah, and I I give there a face palm, uh, a face palm uh, picture because basically I feel like that when I found it out. And this is the, I would say, most important part of the presentation. Please, if you are interested about the self-hosted runners, keep, uh, keep your attention here because this is something you can like uh, not shoot, your, shoot yourself to the feet, but to the head. Uh, so yeah, so demo time. First, I will, I will show you a bit about uh, my demos just to quickly explain uh, the, what I'm doing here. Basically, I don't want to have uh, the internal running runner or something like that. So for that uh, purpose, I've created just a simple Docker file uh, with uh, which will download the GitHub GitHub stuff to connect uh, connect to the container as the self-hosted runner, and then I will launch it. That's it. And you have to have a token with repo public repo uh, uh, public repo permissions. That that's everything, and uh, share it here. So that's it. And open out because I first presented this presentation. I have to presentation the open out, just in case if you are wonder. So, and this is this is uh, my first demo. And uh, basically, I have always uh, two branches, and one is the attack branch, and second is my branch, which uh, which is the base from the attack. And. Uh, I want to say that I'm creating the pull request from uh, basically from my repository to my repository, and it's kind of not how it sh how it is done because the token is always the same. However, uh, believe me that I tried also for this uh, from the uh, from the other repository. So you have to you have to uh, believe uh, believe that I'm not telling you lies here, but I tried it and it's still the same issue. If as far as I'm aware of. So basically, this uh, this is just uh, simple. Uh, okay, let's do it. Oh no. Uh, we have just just a simple workflow file. That's my main, main repository, and contributor will do uh, like uh, contributions to to this one, and it's just like running Echo on Ubuntu host. That's it. No problem with that. So I will I will uh, I will create a pull request. There's a oh, okay. I have to go there. Uh, there's a nope. There has a nice button to create a pull request, but whatever. We will do it this way. So basically, I want this one to this one. I have a few here, but what, uh, just ignore it. And what the attacker do will just change on once it should run. It change the Ubuntu host to the local runner, and the local runner is uh, what what I want to. Uh, put into the repository. So I will switch to the terminal and access uh, and uh, set up my local runner to the to the repository. Yeah, also, I have it uh, configured that it's uh, started just for one uh, one job and then it will die. So and create the pull request. Okay. Where's the button? Where's the button? It hits me. Hmm. It should work. What the? Okay, am I blind? Because <laughs> it should be button. And why it's not? What I'm seeing it. Seems like I'm blind. But OK, whatever. There's already created one. So uh, 
try using instead of rural. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess it could be because I already I already have it created. So I will I will okay I will try it closed. Try to close it. Sorry about this. And I will try to create it again. So hopefully it will allow me to do the pull request now. Uh, it's here, the button. I don't know what's happening. Really. But whatever. So I'm creating the pull request with the change as I described before. You can see the change here. And here is our new job. Sorry, the noise from before. Just ignore it. And as you can see, then it was started on my local runner. And yeah, basically, that's the point. If you have at least one local runner uh, accessed, like uh, configured for your GitHub repository, anyone could create a pull request. Pull request, not pull request target, really. Pull request, uh, use the pull request job or create a new one. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure about the new one for 100%. Uh, could change the to use uh, change the workflow to use your like local runner, your your uh, self-hosted runner, and it will work. And everything with that, like oh, of course, I can change the workflow anyway. So I can read anything on your internal network by that. And it's really, really face -bound. I don't know how to how to otherwise say it, and I really don't understand why GitHub still wasn't able to solve this. But yeah, if you have at least one uh, runner on your uh, on your network or on your repository, your runner on your repository, uh, be aware that you can't have opened pull request targets because these could uh, uh, these could be no pull request targets, sorry, pull request triggers, uh, because this could be easily uh, used against you. I think it's not working for the new ones, new creation, new created ones that we tested it. And just, just for an info, here are also the permissions with that, but it's not really uh, that meaningful here because as I said before, uh, this is a pull request. So this will be permissions uh, from the token, from the from the token of the contributor. So these are permissions on his repository, his their repository, and not on your one. So not really, not really that that problematic part. But this is this is really a face, face palm. Sorry, I'm always I, when I when I see it, I'm always like I wonder how how it's how it's possible that it's still there. So I will I will just clean it up a bit. So this was the demo and how to like how to avoid it. So first, what we did was to change all the pull request triggers to pull request target triggers. And it's annoying. I don't want to have it because of the previous issue, as I described already. And yeah, but you could you could get into the situation like that and it's a way out. Okay, so then I can describe it. Uh, so basically, so we will use a pull request target everywhere. Again, what could go wrong? Another demo. So I will uh, show you, and that's basically what I already explained to you. Uh, that's a simple workflow. Okay, I will make it maybe. Is it readable? Bigger. Yeah. So I, I have a workflow, and the workflow has uh, my script, uh, which will basically run any script. And then there's a my script as the edge, which is just doing a whole, nothing interesting really. So I will I will join my self hosted runner in the background. Okay, the pull request again. And the most important part, of course, there was a pull request target trigger. So it will use like from the from the attack branch. And this is exactly what I was telling, telling you before. Basically that uh, you are able to read the GitHub token 
and to read all the environments from that. And thanks to the GitHub token, you can then you can then use the GitHub token to basically do anything in the repository. Not really anything because there are some uh, permission restrictions, but these are pretty uh, are pretty benevolent. And uh, for example, you can commit, you can force push, you can create issues if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, you can do pretty much of the problematic stuff. So I will create a pull request. So here is it. We will go to checks. Here's the new one. Wait a while. Okay. And here's our job. And here you can see uh, that the job that the, the, the script was executed, and because I had there an env uh, uh, command, you can see all the environment variables in the in the runner. And just for information, there are stars for the GitHub token because GitHub is trying to uh, trying to avoid having in locks something which could be problematic. So when they detect your token uh, in the in the locks, they will make it stars. They make stars from that. But it's really in the lock, like we are seeing here. But you are uh, able to use that from the script. No problem with that. So everything is there, and you can do basically anything. That's it from the demo. So how to avoid having these? And I want to say that some of these, uh, and I will, I will say it on, on directly. So basically, uh, you can restrict permissions for each workflow file. And the permissions uh, are great, and they were added later when we start after we started to use the GitHub Actions. First, we didn't; uh, it wasn't there. And basically, you will set just the contents read. And if you will do anything from the pull request, like if you have the pull request start chat trigger, for example, and you have this here, there, uh, the GitHub token will have privilege just to read the content of the repository, which is publicly accessible. It can't commit, it cannot uh, push, it cannot change the pull request, it cannot do basically anything else. And for most of the use cases, you are you are pretty much fine just with this, but it's not the default. However, uh, you can change the default on your repository uh, in the settings. I'm not sure exactly where, and it will be harder to find uh, to find it right now because they changed the UI for me probably. <laughs> but uh, it will change it by the default, and it could uh, make like I don't know. We did not do that because it could break our existing workflows, and we would uh, rather like to change the permissions for each ex new one new workflow uh, than than switching the defaults to read only because. Doesn't really. Uh, it, it has some drawbacks. I'm not sure exactly well which one right now, but there are some drawbacks with that. Feel free to find. Uh, you will be able to find it if you are interested about it. And the ultimate solution I would say is to request a confirmation from every external contributor uh, for every external contributor. So basically, uh, you have to gate. You will gate uh, external contributions and someone with the uh, right access. To the repository, have to uh, approve uh, the approve the run, and there are two solutions. The old solution was uh, some like I would say handmade, and we still have it because this repository doesn't have much uh, much contributors uh, from the outside, and it just works pretty fine, I would say. So basically, it's just a simple, not simple, but you are query, you are using GitHub. <clears throat> you are using GitHub API uh, to get the permissions of the owner 
like uh, of the of the action in this type who who created the command you will basically find the owner who created the command and get the permissions then the permissions are checked if it has if if it has like uh, so, sorry it's here if it contains admin admin on right so if it has access access ex right access or admin access it will be set to that it's allowed and this specific user could uh, do uh, like could do the approval and then it's uh, it's put basically to we have two jobs for that and the second one requires the first one and the output is then stored to allowed user so it will first check if the allowed user if the, if the user is allowed if not this uh, this uh, job is not even started. So yeah, this is the way. And yeah, sorry, uh, big of correction. We have it here because this is the uh, issue comment, which means that basically when you write a comment, this will be uh, this is the way how to check uh, user permission. The new solution they have doesn't work for the issue comments. It works for pull request only, if I'm not mistaken. And it's basically that uh, GitHub added add new fun functionality to require approval for all outside collaborators. And this is like ultimate solution. I would really, I would really uh, uh, recommend you to have this if you have at least one self-hosted runner or you have you are just like you have a f you you are worrying about getting getting uh, having security issue this is the ultimate solution for each force push or each new pull request to a repository there's a button on the on the bottom of the of the uh, basically next to the test above the tests uh, which is the approve run for people who have the right access so yeah and this is something pretty new they added uh i don't know if it's not a year ago or something like that less than a year ago if i'm not mistaken and we basically changed uh pretty much uh, based on that uh thing uh, like simplified our structure thanks to that and uh they first started with require approval for the first time contributor that was the first step they they did and then they like uh, in, uh, also include uh, for each uh, for for all the outside contributors. The first type contributor was mainly to avoid crypto mining because basically with uh, with this uh, without this and this is the default for the repositories right now for new repositories. Without this, you are able to just uh, go through the GitHub and create a pull request for each GitHub, uh, which will mine your uh, mine your stuff. Because it will be like there, it's it's pretty simple. Basically, you will change existing workflow at, at, or add at a new one. I think I'm not sure about the new, adding new one. It's, it's automatic execution or not. And uh, then you will you will be able able to use their uh, power machine power to that. Uh, yeah, and as I said. They are actively trying to improve the situation. I must say that GitHub is doing uh, really nice, nice steps to improve improve this, and we are users of, I would say, I don't know how many, but yeah, we are heavy users of their new functionality. They are adding, especially about the security. And the best solution of all, this is the end of my presentation, basically, the best solution of all I can recommend it. So this, do not use self-hosted runners if you don't have to have them. It's really a complication for you. It has a nice benefits, but also, yeah, uh, yeah, you can't point the finger, as I said before. It's much easier to like. It's a problem of GitHub. I don't care. <laughs> they have to solve it. <laughs> then, oh, again, uh, my uh, there is a security breach because of my uh, because of my self-hosted runners. Oops. Yep. And that's it from my presentation. I hope you liked it, and uh, we can continue to the questions and answers. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we have a question 
by Jan. Have you tried ephemeral self-hosted runners in fresh VMs? Would that help? Ephemeral self-hosted runners. Yeah, I wonder, hmm. I wonder what exactly do you mean by that? Because ephemeral, I mean, I know that ephemeral is a is a way how to run basically the self-hosted runner, uh, not self -host yeah, the self-hosted runner will be connected just once. And by when you have the ephemeral, uh, parameter uh, for the configuration, it will die after the one job execution. That's what I'm using in in my uh, in my example. But on a fresh VM, if I understand it correctly, it will be just one time machine. It will be definitely beneficial. We did that from the beginning on the level of containers. There were there were a container which around which was there for just one uh, just one uh, job and then died but in general it doesn't help you really because it's still it's still about um, you are still accessible and if the user will be there like 10 minutes or 15 minutes or i don't know what will be your timeout for that you have still 10 or 15 minutes to do a mess on your system, on your network internal network or read all the resources or uh Add there some some uh, back uh, back gate or something like that. So I don't think this is really uh, a solution to that, and we uh, avoid using it after some time because it was really a complication for us. No benefit. Thank you. The next question is from Lukash. The outside collaborators' approval looks interesting. Is it possible to specify groups that can permit certain runners to prevent other company employees to allow runs on our company runner? That can permit certain runners. I don't think it is possible right now. Uh, I think it's like everyone who has right access uh, can start uh, uh, can start these runners. But maybe there's uh, also a question because some some feature functionalities for the GitHub Enterprise specific, and that could be there because I know there are some LDAP changes, etc. But I'm not aware of uh, I never never was uh, in the, uh, there, so I can't tell. But from the basic configuration or the GitHub configuration on the repository, if I know it's not possible. You can ask for the feature. Thank you. And our last question from Yaroslav. Do you write a blog or any articles about these problems? Yeah. Uh, I want to do that, but uh, I hate writing a uh, writing blog post. So maybe I will force myself. <laughs> I, I hope I will force myself, but I want to promise anything. <laughs> Yeah, so let's all hope Yiji will force himself to write blog posts. I think it would be very beneficial. Anyway, thank you for the presentation. We don't have any more questions. It was very interesting. Uh, thank you to the audience for attending. If you'd like, uh, Yiji agreed to be available on the work adventure after, so you can catch him there, ask him questions, talk. It's thank a you a lot. Thank you a lot for attending. So thank you again very much.